Chapter seven of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter seven. Of the necessary consequences of the Hartleyan theory, of the original mistake or equivocation which procured its admission, Memoria Technica. We will pass by the utter incompatibility of such a law, if law it may be called which would itself be a slave of chances, with even that appearance of rationality forced upon us by the outward phenomena of human conduct, abstracted from our own consciousness, we will agree to forget this for the moment, in order to fix our attention on that subordination of final to efficient causes in the human being, which flows of necessity from the assumption that the will, and with the will, all acts of thought and attention are parts and products of this blind mechanism, instead of being distinct powers the function of which it is to control determine and modify the phantasmal chaos of association the soul becomes a mere ens logicum for as a real separable being it would be more worthless and ludicrous than the grimalkins in the cat harpsichord described in the spectator for these did form a part of the process but to hartley's scheme the soul is present only to be pinched or stroked while the very squeals or purring are produced by an agency wholly independent and alien it involves all the difficulties all the incomprehensibility if it be not indeed os imoige de kei the absurdity of intercommunion between substances that have no one property in common without any of the convenient consequences that bribe the judgment to the admission of the dualistic hypothesis accordingly this caput mortuum of the hartleyan process has been rejected by his followers and the consciousness considered as a result as a tune the common product of the breeze and the harp though this again is the mere remotion of one absurdity to make way for another equally preposterous for what is harmony but a mode of relation the very essay of which is percipi and ens rationale which presupposes the power that by perceiving creates it the razor's edge becomes a sore to the armed vision and the delicious melodies of purcell or Cimarosa might be disjointed stammerings to a hearer whose partition of time should be a thousand times subtler than ours but this obstacle too let us imagine ourselves to have surmounted and at one bound high over leap all bound yet according to this hypothesis the disquisition to which i am at present soliciting the reader's attention may be as truly said to be written by st paul's church as by me for it is the mere motion of my muscles and nerves and these again are set in motion from external causes equally passive which external causes stand themselves in interdependent connection with everything that exists or has existed thus the whole universe co-operates to produce the minutest stroke of every letter save only that i myself and i alone have nothing to do with it but merely the causeless and effectless beholding of it when it is done yet scarcely can it be called a beholding for it is neither an act nor an effect but an impossible creation of a something nothing out of its very contrary it is the mere quicksilver plating behind a looking-glass and in this alone consists the poor worthless i the sum total of my moral and intellectual intercourse dissolved into its elements is reduced to extension motion degrees of velocity and those diminished copies of configurative motion which form what we call notions and notions of notions of such philosophy well might butler say the metaphysics but a puppet motion that goes with screws the notion of a notion the copy of a copy and lame draught are naturally taken from a thought that counterfeits all pantomimic tricks and turns the eyes like an old crucifix that counterchanges whatsoe'er it calls by another name and makes it true or false turns truth to falsehood falsehood into truth by virtue of the babylonian's tooth the inventor of the watch if this doctrine be true did not in reality invent it he only looked on while the blind causes the only true artists were unfolding themselves so must it have been too with my friend alston when he sketched his picture of the dead man revived by the bones of the prophet elijah so must it have been with mr southey and lord byron when the one fancied himself composing his roderick and the other his child harold the same must hold good of all systems of philosophy of all arts governments wars by sea and by land in short of all things that ever have been or that ever will be produced for according to this system it is not the affections and passions that are at work in as far as they are sensations or thoughts we only fancy that we act from rational resolves or prudent motives or from impulses of anger love or generosity in all these cases the real agent is a something nothing everything which does all of which we know and knows nothing of all that itself does the existence of an infinite spirit of an intelligent and holy will must on this system be mere articulated motions of the air for as the function of the human understanding is no other than merely to appear to itself to combine and to apply the phenomena of the association and as these derive all their reality from the primary sensations and the sensations again all their reality from the impressions ab extra 
a god not visible audible or tangible can exist only in the sounds and letters that form his name and attributes if in ourselves there be no such faculties as those of the will and the scientific reason we must either have an innate idea of them which would overthrow the whole system or we can have no idea at all the process by which hume degraded the notion of cause and effect into a blind product of delusion and habit into the mere sensation of preceding life nisus vitalis associated with the images of the memory this same process must be repeated to the equal degradation of every fundamental idea in ethics or theology far very far am i from burdening with the odium of these consequences the moral characters of those who first formed or have since adopted the system it is most noticeable of the excellent and pious hartley that in the proofs of the existence and attributes of god with which his second volume commences he makes no reference to the principle or results of the first nay he assumes as his foundations ideas which if we embrace the doctrines of his first volume can exist nowhere but in the vibrations of the ethereal medium common to the nerves and to the atmosphere indeed the whole of the second volume is with the fewest possible exceptions independent of his peculiar system so true is it that the faith which saves and sanctifies is a collective energy a total act of the whole moral being that its living sensorium is in the heart and that no errors of the understanding can be morally arraigned unless they have proceeded from the heart but whether they be such no man can be certain in the case of another scarcely perhaps even in his own hence it follows by inevitable consequence that man may perchance determine what is a heresy but god only can know who is a heretic it does not however by any means follow that opinions fundamentally false are harmless a hundred causes may coexist to form one complex antidote yet the sting of the adder remains venomous though there are many who have taken up the evil thing and it hurted them not some indeed there seem to have been in an unfortunate neighbour nation at least who have embraced this system with a full view of all its moral and religious consequences some who deem themselves most free when they within this gross and visible sphere chain down the winged thought scoffing assent proud in their meanness and themselves they cheat with noisy emptiness of learned phrase their subtle fluids impacts essences self-working tools uncaused effects and all those blind omniscience those almighty slaves untenanting creation of its god such men need discipline not argument they must be made better men before they can become wiser the attention will be more profitably employed in attempting to discover and expose the paralogisms by the magic of which such a faith could find admission into minds framed for a nobler creed these it appears to me may be all reduced to one sophism as their common genus the mistaking the conditions of a thing for its causes and essence and the process by which we arrive at the knowledge of a faculty for the faculty itself the air i breathe is the condition of my life not its cause we could never have learned that we had eyes but by the process of seeing yet having seen we know that the eyes must have pre-existed in order to render the process of sight possible let us cross-examine hartley's scheme under the guidance of this distinction and we shall discover that contemporaneity leibniz's lex continui is the limit and condition of the laws of mind itself being rather a law of matter at least of phenomena considered as material at the utmost it is to thought the same as the law of gravitation is to locomotion in every voluntary movement we first counteract gravitation in order to avail ourselves of it it must exist that there may be a something to be counteracted and which by its reaction may aid the force that is exerted to resist it let us consider what we do when we leap we first resist the gravitating power by an act purely voluntary and then by another act voluntary in part we yield to it in order to alight on the spot which we had previously proposed to ourselves now let a man watch his mind while he is composing or to take a still more common case while he is trying to recollect a name and he will find the process completely analogous most of my readers will have observed a small water insect on the surface of rivulets which throws a sank spotted shadow fringed with prismatic colours on the sunny bottom of the brook and will have noticed how the little animal winds its way up against the stream by alternate pulses of active and passive motion now resisting the current and now yielding to it in order to gather strength and a momentary fulcrum for a further propulsion this is no unapt emblem of the mind's self-experience in the act of thinking there are evidently two powers at work which relatively to each other are active and passive and this is not possible without an intermediate faculty which is at once both active and passive in philosophical language we must denominate this intermediate faculty in all its degrees and determinations the imagination but in common language and especially on the subject of poetry we appropriate the name to a superior degree of the faculty joined to a superior voluntary control over it contemporaneity then being the common condition of all the laws of association and a component element in the materia subjecta the parts of which are to be associated must needs be co-present with all nothing therefore can be more easy than to pass off on an incautious mind this constant companion of each 
for the essential substance of all but if we appeal to our own consciousness we shall find that even time itself as the cause of a particular act of association is distinct from contemporaneity as the condition of all association seeing a mackerel it may happen that i immediately think of gooseberries because i at the same time ate mackerel with gooseberries as the source the first syllable of the latter word being that which had coexisted with the image of the bird so called i may then think of a goose in the next moment the image of a swan may arise before me though i had never seen the two birds together in the first two instances i am conscious that their coexistence in time was the circumstance that enabled me to recollect them and equally conscious am i that the latter was recalled to me by the joint operation of likeness and contrast so it is with cause and effect so too with order so i am able to distinguish whether it was proximity in time or continuity in space that occasioned me to recall b on the mention of a they cannot be indeed separated from contemporaneity for that would be to separate them from the mind itself the act of consciousness is indeed identical with time considered in its essence i mean time per se as contradistinguished from our notion of time for this is always blended with the idea of space which as the opposite of time is therefore its measure nevertheless the accident of seeing two objects at the same moment and the accident of seeing them in the same place are two distinct or distinguishable causes and the true practical general law of association is this that whatever makes certain parts of a total impression more vivid or distinct than the rest will determine the mind to recall these in preference to others equally linked together by the common condition of contemporaneity or what i deem a more appropriate and philosophical term of continuity but the will itself by confining and intensifying the attention may arbitrarily give vividness or distinctness to any object whatsoever and from hence we may deduce the uselessness if not the absurdity of certain recent schemes which promise an artificial memory but which in reality can only produce a confusion and debasement of the fancy sound logic as the habitual subordination of the individual to the species and of the species to the genus philosophical knowledge of facts under the relation of cause and effect a cheerful and communicative temper disposing us to notice the similarities and contrasts of things that we may be able to illustrate the one by the other a quiet conscience a condition free from anxieties sound health and above all as far as relates to passive remembrance a healthy digestion these are the best these are the only arts of memory End of chapter 7chapter eight of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee biographia literaria by samuel taylor coleridge chapter eight the system of dualism introduced by descartes refined first by spinoza and afterwards by leibnitz into the doctrine of harmonia praestabilita hylozoism materialism none of these systems or any possible theory of association supplies or supersedes a theory of perception or explains the formation of the associable to the best of my knowledge descartes was the first philosopher who introduced the absolute and essential heterogeneity of the soul as intelligence and the body as matter the assumption and the form of speaking have remained though the denial of all other properties to matter but that of extension on which denial the whole system of dualism is grounded has been long exploded for since impenetrability is intelligible only as a mode of resistance its admission places the essence of matter in an act or power which it possesses in common with spirit and body and spirit are therefore no longer absolutely heterogeneous but may without any absurdity be supposed to be different modes or degrees in perfection of a common substratum to this possibility however it was not the fashion to advert the soul was the thinking substance and body a space-filling substance yet the apparent action of each on the other pressed heavy on the philosopher on the one hand and no less heavily on the other hand pressed the evident truth that the law of causality holds only between homogeneous things that is things having some common property and cannot extend from one world into another its contrary a close analysis evinced it to be no less absurd than the question whether a man's affection for his wife lay north-east or south-west of the love he bore towards his child leibnitz's doctrine of a pre-established harmony which he certainly borrowed from spinoza who had himself taken the hint from descartes animal machines was in its common interpretation too strange to survive the inventor too repugnant to our common sense which is not indeed entitled to a judicial voice in the course of scientific philosophy but whose whispers still exert a strong secret influence even wolf the admirer and illustrious systematizer of the leibnizian doctrine contents himself with defending the possibility of the idea but does not adopt it as a part of the edifice the hypothesis of hylozoism on the other side is the death of all rational physiology and indeed of all physical science 
for that requires a limitation of terms and cannot consist with the arbitrary power of multiplying attributes by occult qualities besides it answers no purpose unless indeed a difficulty can be solved by multiplying it or we can acquire a clearer notion of our soul by being told that we have a million of souls and that every atom of our bodies has a soul of its own far more prudent is it to admit the difficulty once for all and then let it lie at rest there is a sediment indeed at the bottom of the vessel but all the water above it is clear and transparent the hylozoist only shakes it up and renders all turbid but it is not either the nature of man or the duty of the philosopher to despair concerning any important problem until as in the squaring of the circle the impossibility of a solution has been demonstrated how the essay assumed as originally distinct from the sire can ever unite itself with it how being can transform itself into a knowing becomes conceivable on one only condition namely if it can be shown that the vis representativa or the sentient is itself a species of being that is either as a property or attribute or as an hypostasis or self-subsistence the former that thinking is a property of matter under particular conditions is indeed the assumption of materialism a system which could not but be patronized by the philosopher if only it actually performed what it promises but how any affection from without can metamorphose itself into perception or will the materialist has hitherto left not only as incomprehensible as he found it but has aggravated it into a comprehensible absurdity for grant that an object from without could act upon the conscious self as on a consubstantial object yet such an affection could only engender something homogeneous with itself motion could only propagate motion matter has no inward we remove one surface but to meet with another we can but divide a particle into particles and each atom comprehends in itself the properties of the material universe let any reflecting mind make the experiment of explaining to itself the evidence of our sensuous intuitions from the hypothesis that in any given perception there is a something which has been communicated to it by an impact or an impression ab extra in the first place by the impact on the percipient or ends representans not the object itself but only its action or effect will pass into the same not the iron tongue but its vibrations pass into the metal of the bell now in our immediate perception it is not the mere power or act of the object but the object itself which is immediately present we might indeed attempt to explain this result by a chain of deductions and conclusions but that first the very faculty of deducing and concluding would equally demand an explanation and secondly that there exists in fact no such intermediation by logical notions such as those of cause and effect it is the object itself not the product of a syllogism which is present to our consciousness or would we explain this supervention of the object to the sensation by a productive faculty set in motion by an impulse still the transition into the percipient of the object itself from which the impulse proceeded assumes a power that can permeate and wholly possess the soul and like a god by spiritual art be all in all and all in every part and how came the percipient here and what has become of the wonder promising matter that was to perform all these marvels by force of mere figure weight and motion the most consistent proceeding of the dogmatic materialist is to fall back into the common rank of soul and bodyists to affect the mysterious and declare the whole process of revelation given and not to be understood which it would be profane to examine too closely dato non intelligitur but a revelation unconfirmed by miracles and a faith not commanded by the conscience a philosopher may venture to pass by without suspecting himself of any irreligious tendency thus as materialism has been generally taught it is utterly unintelligible and owes all its proselytes to the propensity so common among men to mistake distinct images for clear conceptions and vice versa to reject as inconceivable whatever from its own nature is unimaginable but as soon as it becomes intelligible it ceases to be materialism in order to explain thinking as a material phenomenon it is necessary to refine matter into a mere modification of intelligence with a twofold function of appearing and perceiving even so did priestley in his controversy with price he stripped matter of all its material properties substituted spiritual powers and when we expected to find a body behold we had nothing but its ghost the apparition of a defunct substance i shall not dilate further on this subject because it will if god grant health and permission be treated of at large and systematically in a work which i have many years been preparing on the productive logos human and divine with and as the introduction to a full commentary on the gospel of st john to make myself intelligible as far as my present subject requires it will be sufficient briefly to observe one that all association demands and presupposes the existence of the thoughts and images to be associated two that the hypothesis of an external world exactly correspondent to those images or modifications of our own being which alone according to this system we actually behold is as thorough idealism as barclay's inasmuch as it equally perhaps in a more perfect degree removes all reality and immediateness of perception and places us in a dream-world of phantoms and spectres 
the inexplicable swarm and equivocal generation of motions in our own brains three that this hypothesis neither involves the explanation nor precludes the necessity of a mechanism and co-adequate forces in the percipient which at the more than magic touch of the impulse from without is to create anew for itself the correspondent object the formation of a copy is not solved by the mere pre-existence of an original the copies of raphael's transfiguration must repeat more or less perfectly the process of raphael it would be easy to explain a thought from the image on the retina and that from the geometry of light if this very light did not present the very same difficulty we might as rationally chant the brime creed of the tortoise that supported the bear that supported the elephant that supported the world to the tune of this is the house that jack built the sic deo placitum est we all admit as the sufficient cause and the divine goodness as the sufficient reason but an answer to the whence and why is no answer to the how which alone is the physiologist's concern it is a sophisma pigrum and as bacon hath said the arrogance of pusillanimity which lifts up the idol of a mortal's fancy and commands us to fall down and worship it as a work of divine wisdom an ansile or palladium fallen from heaven by the very same argument the supporters of the ptolemaic system might have rebuffed the newtonian and pointing to the sky with self-complacent grin have appealed to common sense whether the sun did not move and the earth stand still end of chapter eight chapter nine of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee biographia literaria by samuel taylor coleridge chapter nine is philosophy possible as a science and what are its conditions giordano bruno literary aristocracy or the existence of a tacit compact among the learned as a privileged order the author's obligations to the mystics to immanuel kant the difference between the letter and the spirit of kant's writings and a vindication of prudence in the teaching of philosophy victor's attempt to complete the critical system its partial success and ultimate failure obligations to schelling and among english writers to Somaris after i had successively studied in the schools of locke berkeley leibnitz and hartley and could find in none of them an abiding place for my reason i began to ask myself is a system of philosophy as different from mere history and historic classification possible if possible what are its necessary conditions i was for a while disposed to answer the first question in the negative and to admit that the sole practicable employment for the human mind was to observe to collect and to classify but i soon felt that human nature itself fought up against this wilful resignation of intellect and as soon did i find that the scheme taken with all its consequences and cleared of all inconsistencies was not less impracticable than contra-natural assume in its full extent the position nihil in intellectu quod non prius in sensu assume it without leibnitz's qualifying praeter ipsum intellectum and in the same sense in which the position was understood by hartley and condiac and then what hume had demonstrably deduced from this concession concerning cause and effect would apply with equal and crushing force to all the other eleven categorical forms and the logical functions corresponding to them how can we make bricks without straw or build without cement we learn all things indeed by occasion of experience but the very facts so learned force us inward on the antecedents that must be presupposed in order to render experience itself possible the first book of locke's essay if the supposed error which it labours to subvert be not a mere thing of straw an absurdity which no man ever did or indeed ever could believe is formed on a sophisma heterozeitius and involves the old mistake of cum hoc ergo propter hoc the term philosophy defines itself as an affectionate seeking after the truth but truth is the correlative of being this again is no way conceivable but by assuming as a postulate that both are ab initio identical and coherent that intelligence and being are reciprocally each other's substrate i presume that this was a possible conception i e that it involved no logical inconsonance from the length of time during which the scholastic definition of the supreme being as actus purissimus sine ulla potentialitate was received in the schools of theology both by the pontifician and the reformed divines the early study of plato and plotinus with the commentaries and the theologia platonica of the illustrious florentine of proclus and gemistius plato and at a later period of the de immenso et innumera billi and the de la causa principio et uno of the philosopher of nola who could boast of a sir philip sidney and fulk greville among his patrons and whom the idolaters of rome burnt as an atheist in the year sixteen hundred had all contributed to prepare my mind for the reception and welcoming of the cogito quia sum 
et sum quia cogito a philosophy of seeming hardihood but certainly the most ancient and therefore presumptively the most natural why need i be afraid say rather how dare i be ashamed of the teutonic theosophist jacob beeman many indeed and gross were his delusions and such as furnish frequent and ample occasion for the triumph of the learned over the poor ignorant shoemaker who had dared think for himself but while we remember that these delusions were such as might be anticipated from his utter want of all intellectual discipline and from his ignorance of rational psychology let it not be forgotten that the latter defect he had in common with the most learned theologians of his age neither with books nor with book-learned men was he conversant a meek and shy quietist his intellectual powers were never stimulated into feverous energy by crowds of proselytes or by the ambition of proselyting jacob beam was an enthusiast in the strictest sense as not merely distinguished but as contradistinguished from a fanatic while i in part translate the following observations from a contemporary writer of the continent let me be permitted to premise that i might have transcribed the substance from memoranda of my own which were written many years before his pamphlet was given to the world and that i prefer another's words to my own partly as a tribute due to priority of publication but still more from the pleasure of sympathy in a case where coincidence only was possible whoever is acquainted with the history of philosophy during the last two or three centuries cannot but admit that there appears to have existed a sort of secret and tacit compact among the learned not to pass beyond a certain limit in speculative science the privilege of free thought so highly extolled has at no time been held valid in actual practice except within this limit and not a single stride beyond it has ever been ventured without bringing obloquy on the transgressor the few men of genius among the learned class who actually did overstep this boundary anxiously avoided the appearance of having so done therefore the true depth of science and the penetration to the inmost centre from which all the lines of knowledge diverged to the ever distant circumference was abandoned to the illiterate and the simple whom unstilled yearning and an original ebulliency of spirit had urged to the investigation of the indwelling and living ground of all things these then because their names had never been enrolled in the guilds of the learned were persecuted by the registered liverymen as interlopers on their rights and privileges all without distinction were branded as fanatics and phantasts not only those whose wild and exorbitant imaginations had actually engendered only extravagant and grotesque phantasms and whose productions were for the most part poor copies and gross caricatures of genuine inspiration but the truly inspired likewise the originals themselves and this for no other reason but because they were the unlearned men of humble and obscure occupations when and from whom among the literati by profession have we ever heard the divine doxology repeated i thank thee o father lord of heaven and earth because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes no the haughty priests of learning not only banished from the schools and marts of science all who had dared draw living waters from the fountain but drove them out of the very temple which meantime the buyers and sellers and money-changers were suffered to make a den of thieves and yet it would not be easy to discover any substantial ground for this contemptuous pride in those literati who have most distinguished themselves by their scorn of beeman thalerus george fox and others unless it be that they could write orthographically make smooth periods and have the fashions of authorship almost literally at their fingers ends while the latter in simplicity of soul made their words immediate echoes of their feelings hence the frequency of those phrases among them which have been mistaken for pretences to immediate inspiration as for instance it was delivered unto me i strove not to speak i said i will be silent but the word was in my heart as a burning fire and i could not forbear hence too the unwillingness to give offence hence the foresight and the dread of the clamours which would be raised against them so frequently avowed in the writings of these men and expressed as was natural in the words of the only book with which they were familiar woe is me that i am become a man of strife and a man of contention i love peace the souls of men are dear unto me yet because i seek for light every one of them doth curse me oh it requires deeper feeling and a stronger imagination than belong to most of those to whom reasoning and fluent expression have been as a trade learnt in boyhood to conceive with what might with what inward strivings and commotion the perception of a new and vital truth takes possession of an uneducated man of genius his meditations are almost inevitably employed on the eternal or the everlasting for the world is not his friend nor the world's law need we then be surprised that under an excitement at once so strong and so unusual the man's body should sympathize with the struggles of his mind or that he should at times be so far deluded as to mistake the tumultuous sensations of his nerves and the co-existing spectres of his fancy as parts or symbols of the truths which were opening on him it has indeed been plausibly observed that in order to derive any advantage or to collect any intelligible meaning from the writings of these ignorant mystics the reader must bring with him a spirit and judgment superior to that of the writers themselves and what he brings what needs he elsewhere seek 
a sophism which i fully agree with warburton is unworthy of milton how much more so of the awful person in whose mouth he has placed it one assertion i will venture to make as suggested by my own experience that there exist folios on the human understanding and the nature of man which would have a far just claim to their high rank and celebrity if in the whole huge volume there could be found as much fulness of heart and intellect as burst forth in many a simple page of george fox jacob beeman and even of beeman's commentator the pious and fervid william law the feeling of gratitude which i cherish toward these men has caused me to digress further than i had foreseen or proposed but to have passed them over in an historical sketch of my literary life and opinions would have seemed to me like the denial of a debt the concealment of a boon for the writings of these mystics acted in no slight degree to prevent my mind from being imprisoned within the outline of any single dogmatic system they contributed to keep alive the heart in the head gave me an indistinct yet stirring and working presentiment that all the products of the mere reflective faculty partook of death and were as the rattling twigs and sprays in winter into which a sap was yet to be propelled from some root to which i had not penetrated if they were to afford my soul either food or shelter if they were too often a moving cloud of smoke to me by day yet they were always a pillar of fire throughout the night during my wanderings through the wilderness of doubt and enable me to skirt without crossing the sandy deserts of utter unbelief that the system is capable of being converted into an irreligious pantheism i well know the ethics of spinoza may or may not be an instance but at no time could i believe that in itself and essentially it is incompatible with religion natural or revealed and now i am most thoroughly persuaded of the contrary the writings of the illustrious sage of konigsberg the founder of the critical philosophy more than any other work at once invigorated and disciplined my understanding the originality the depth and the compression of the thoughts the novelty and subtlety yet solidity and importance of the distinctions the adamantine chain of the logic and i will venture to add paradox as it will appear to those who have taken their notion of immanuel kant from reviewers and frenchmen the clearness and evidence of the critique of the pure reason and critique of the judgment of the metaphysical elements of natural philosophy and of his religion within the bounds of pure reason took possession of me as with the giant's hand after fifteen years familiarity with them i still read these and all his other productions with undiminished delight and increasing admiration the few passages that remained obscure to me after due efforts of thought as the chapter on original apperception and the apparent contradictions which occur i soon found were hints and insinuations referring to ideas which kant either did not think it prudent to avow or which he considered as consistently left behind in a pure analysis not of human nature in toto but of the speculative intellect alone here therefore he was constrained to commence at the point of reflection or natural consciousness while in his moral system he was permitted to assume a higher ground the autonomy of the will as a postulate deducible from the unconditional command or in the technical language of his school the categorical imperative of the conscience he had been in imminent danger of persecution during the reign of the late king of prussia that strange compound of lawless debauchery and priest-ridden superstition and it is probable that he had little inclination in his old age to act over again the fortunes and hairbreadth escapes of wolf the expulsion of the first among kant's disciples who attempted to complete his system from the university of jena with the confiscation and prohibition of the obnoxious work by the joint efforts of the courts of saxony and hanover supplied experimental proof that the venerable old man's caution was not groundless in spite therefore of his own declarations i could never believe that it was possible for him to have meant no more by his noumenon or thing in itself than his mere words express or that in his own conception he confined the whole plastic power to the forms of the intellect leaving for the external cause for the material of our sensations a matter without form which is doubtless inconceivable i entertain doubts likewise whether in his own mind he even laid all the stress which he appears to do on the moral postulates an idea in the highest sense of that word cannot be conveyed but by a symbol and except in geometry all symbols of necessity involve an apparent contradiction for nasi sine toisin and for those who could not pierce through this symbolic husk his writings were not intended questions which cannot be fully answered without exposing the respondent to personal danger are not entitled to a fair answer and yet to say this openly would in many cases furnish the very advantage which the adversary is insidiously seeking after veracity does not consist in saying but in the intention of communicating truth and the philosopher who cannot utter the whole truth without conveying falsehood and at the same time perhaps exciting the most malignant passions is constrained to express himself either mythically or equivocally when kant therefore was importuned to settle the disputes of his commentators himself by declaring what he meant how could he decline the honours of martyrdom with less offence than by simply replying i meant what i said 
and at the age of near fourscore I have something else and more important to do than to write a commentary on my own works. Fichte's Wissenschaftslehre, or Law of Ultimate Science, was to add the keystone of the arch, and by commencing with an act, instead of a thing or substance, Fichte assuredly gave the first mortal blow to Spinozism, as taught by Spinoza himself, and supplied the idea of a system truly metaphysical, and of a metaphysic truly systematic, i.e. having its spring and principle within itself. But this fundamental idea he overbuilt with a heavy mass of mere notions, and psychological acts of arbitrary reflection. Thus his theory degenerated into crude egoismus, a boastful and hyperstoic hostility to nature, as lifeless, godless, and altogether unholy, while his religion consisted in the assumption of a mere ordo ordinans, which we were permitted ex exoterice to call God, and his ethics in an ascetic and almost monkish mortification of the natural passions and desires. In Schelling's Natur Philosophie and the System des Transcendentalen Idealismus, I first found a genial coincidence with much that I had toiled out for myself, and a powerful assistance in what I had yet to do. I have introduced this statement, as appropriate to the narrative nature of this sketch, yet rather in reference to the work which I have announced in a preceding page, than to my present subject. It would be but a mere act of justice to myself, were I to warn my future readers, than an identity of thought, or even similarity of phrase, will not be at all times a certain proof that the passage has been borrowed from Schelling, or that the conceptions were originally learnt from him. In this instance, as in the dramatic lectures of Schlegel, to which I have before alluded, from the same motive of self-defence against the charge of plagiarism, many of the most striking resemblances, indeed all the main and fundamental ideas, were born and matured in my mind, before I had ever seen a single page of the German philosopher. And I might indeed affirm with truth, before the more important works of Schelling had been written, or at least made public. Nor is this coincidence at all to be wondered at. We had studied in the same school, been disciplined by the same preparatory philosophy, namely the writings of Kant. We had both equal obligations to the polar logic and dynamic philosophy of Giordano Bruno, and Schelling has lately, and as of recent acquisition, avowed that same affectionate reverence for the labours of Beeman and other mystics, which I had formed at a much earlier period. The coincidence of Schelling's system with certain general ideas of Beeman, he declares to have been mere coincidence, while my obligations have been more direct. He needs give to Beeman only feelings of sympathy, while I owe him a debt of gratitude. God forbid that I should be suspected of a wish to enter into a rivalry with Schelling, for the honour is so unequivocally his right, not only as a great and original genius, but as the founder of the philosophy of nature, and as the most successful improver of the dynamic system which, begun by Bruno, was reintroduced, in a more philosophical form, and freed from all its impurities and visionary accompaniments, by Kant, in whom it was the native and necessary growth of his own system. Kant's followers, however, on whom, for the greater part, their master's cloak had fallen without, or with a very scanty portion of, his spirit, had adopted his dynamic ideas only as a more refined species of mechanics. With exception of one or two fundamental ideas, which cannot be withheld from Fichte, to Schelling we owe the completion and the most important victories of this revolution in philosophy. To me it will be happiness and honour enough, should I succeed in rendering the system itself intelligible to my countrymen, and in the application of it to the most awful of subjects, for the most important of purposes. Whether a work is the offspring of a man's own spirit, and the product of original thinking, will be discovered by those who are its sole legitimate judges, by better tests than the mere reference to dates. For readers in general, let whatever shall be found in this or any future work of mine, that resembles or coincides with the doctrines of my German predecessor, though contemporary, be wholly attributed to him, provided that the absence of distinct references to his books, which I could not at all times make, with truth, as designing citations, or thoughts actually derived from him, and which I trust would, after this general acknowledgment, be superfluous, be not charged on me as an ungenerous concealment or intentional plagiarism. I have not, indeed, a hue res angusta domi, been hitherto able to procure more than two of his books, viz. the first volume of his collected tracts, and his system of transcendental idealism, to which, however, I must add a small pamphlet against Fichte, the spirit of which was to my feelings painfully incongruous with the principles, and which, with the usual allowance afforded to an antithesis, displayed the love of wisdom rather than the wisdom of love. I regard truth as a divine ventriloquist. I care not from whose mouth the sounds are supposed to proceed, if only the words are audible and intelligible. Albeit I must confess to be half in doubt, whether I should bring it forth or no, it being so contrary to the eye of the world, and the world so potent in most men's hearts, that I shall endanger either not to be regarded or not to be understood. 
and to conclude the subject of citation with a cluster of citations which as taken from books not in common use may contribute to the reader's amusement as a voluntary before a sermon dolet mihi quidem delicius literarum in subito iam homines adeo esse praesertim qui christiano se profitentu et legere nisi quod ad dilectationem fecit sustineant nihil unde et discipline serviores et philosophia ipsa iam feri prosus etiam adoctis negliguntur quod quidem propositum studiorum nisi mature corrigitur tam magnum rebus incommodum dabit quam dedit barbaries olim pertinax res barbaries es fateo sed minus potent tamen quam illa molities et persuasa prudentia literarum si ratione caret sapientiae virtutisque specie mortales misere circumducens sucedet igitu ut arbitro haud ita multo post pro rusticana seculi nostri ruditate captatrix illa communi loquentia robu animi virilis omne omnem virtutem masculum profligatura nisi caveto a too prophetic remark which has been in fulfilment from the year sixteen eighty to the present eighteen fifteen by persuasa prudentia Grunaeus means self-complacent common sense as opposed to science and philosophic reason es medius ordo at velut equestris ingeniorum quidem sagacium at commodorum rebus humanis non tamenem primam magnitudinem patentium eorum hominum ut sic dicam major anona est sedulum esse nihil temere loqui asvescere labori et imagine prudentiae et modestiae tedre angustiores partes captus dum exercitationem ac usum quo isti in civilibus rebus polent pro natura et magnitudine ingenii plerique accipiunt as therefore physicians are many times forced to leave such methods of curing as themselves know to be the fittest and being overruled by the patient's impatiency are fain to try the best they can in like sort considering how the case doth stand with this present age full of tongue and weak of brain behold we would if our subject permitted it yield to the stream thereof that way we would be contented to prove our thesis which being the worse in itself is notwithstanding now by reason of common imbecility the fitter and likelier to be brooked if this fear could be rationally entertained in the controversial age of hooker under the then robust discipline of the scholastic logic pardonably may a writer of the present times anticipate a scanty audience for abstrusest themes and truths that can neither be communicated nor received without effort of thought as well as patience of attention que sio non ero al calcola de punti pa casinina stella a noi predomini el somaro el castron si sion congiunti il tempo d'apuleo più non si nomini che se allora un sol uom sembrava un asino mille asini a miei di rassembran uomini End of chapter nine chapter ten part one of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee biographia literaria by samuel taylor coleridge chapter ten part one a chapter of digression and anecdotes as an interlude preceding that on the nature and genesis of the imagination or plastic power on pedantry and pedantic expressions advice to young authors respecting publication various anecdotes of the author's literary life and the progress of his opinions in religion and politics esemplastic the word is not in johnson nor have i met with it elsewhere neither have i i constructed it myself from the greek words eis and platein to shape into one because having to convey a new sense i thought that a new term would both aid the recollection of my meaning and prevent its being confounded with the usual import of the word imagination but this is pedantry not necessarily so i hope if i am not misinformed pedantry consists in the use of words unsuitable to the time place and company the language of the market would be in the schools as pedantic though it might not be reprobated by that name as the language of the schools in the market the mere man of the world who insists that no other terms but such as occur in common conversation should be employed in a scientific disquisition and with no greater precision is as truly a pedant as the man of letters who either overrating the acquirements of his auditors or misled by his own familiarity with technical or scholastic terms converses at the wine-table with his mind fixed on his museum or laboratory even though the latter pedant instead of desiring his wife to make the tea should bid her add to the quant suff of thea sinensis the oxide of hydrogen saturated with caloric 
to use the colloquial and in truth somewhat vulgar metaphor if the pedant of the cloister and the pedant of the lobby both smell equally of the shop yet the odour from the russian binding of good old authentic-looking folios and quartos is less annoying than the steams from the tavern or bagno nay though the pedantry of the scholar should betray a little ostentation yet a well-conditioned mind would more easily methinks tolerate the fox-brush of learned vanity than the sans culottery of a contemptuous ignorance that assumes a merit from mutilation in the self-consoling sneer at the pompous encumbrance of tales the first lesson of philosophic discipline is to wean the student's attention from the degrees of things which alone form the vocabulary of common life and to direct it to the kind abstracted from degree thus the chemical student is taught not to be startled at disquisitions on the heat in ice or on latent and fixable light in such discourse the instructor has no other alternative than either to use old words with new meanings the plan adopted by darwin in his zoonomia or to introduce new terms after the example of linnaeus and the framers of the present chemical nomenclature the latter mode is evidently preferable were it only that the former demands a twofold exertion of thought in one and the same act for the reader or hearer is required not only to learn and bear in mind the new definition but to unlearn and keep out of his view the old and habitual meaning a far more difficult and perplexing task and for which the mere semblance of eschewing pedantry seems to me an inadequate compensation where indeed it is in our power to recall an unappropriate term that had without sufficient reason become obsolete it is doubtless a less evil to restore than to coin anew thus to express in one word all that appertains to the perception considered as passive and merely recipient i have adopted from our elder classics the word sensuous because sensual is not at present used except in a bad sense or at least as a moral distinction while sensitive and sensible would each convey a different meaning thus too have i followed hooker sanderson milton and others in designating the immediateness of any act or object of knowledge by the word intuition used sometimes subjectively sometimes objectively even as we use the word thought now as the thought or act of thinking and now as a thought or the object of our reflection and we do this without confusion or obscurity the very words objective and subjective of such constant recurrence in the schools of yore i have ventured to reintroduce because i could not so briefly or conveniently by any more familiar terms distinguish the percipere from the percipi lastly i have cautiously discriminated the terms the reason and the understanding encouraged and confirmed by the authority of our genuine divines and philosophers before the revolution both life and sense fancy and understanding whence the soul reason receives and reason is her being discursive or intuitive discourse is oftest yours the latter most is ours differing but in degree in kind the same i say that i was confirmed by authority so venerable for i had previous and higher motives in my own conviction of the importance nay of the necessity of the distinction as both an indispensable condition and a vital part of all sound speculation in metaphysics ethical or theological to establish this distinction was one main object of the friend if even in a biography of my own literary life i can with propriety refer to a work which was printed rather than published or so published that it had been well for the unfortunate author if it had remained in manuscript i have even at this time bitter cause for remembering that which a number of my subscribers have but a trifling motive for forgetting this effusion might have been spared but i would fain flatter myself that the reader will be less austere than an oriental professor of the bastinado who during an attempt to extort per argumentum baculinum a full confession from a culprit interrupted his outcry of pain by reminding him that it was a mere digression all this noise sir is nothing to the point and no sort of answer to my questions ah but replied the sufferer it is the most pertinent reply in nature to your blows an imprudent man of common goodness of heart cannot but wish to turn even his imprudences to the benefit of others as far as this is possible if therefore any one of the readers of this semi-narrative should be preparing or intending a periodical work i warn him in the first place against trusting in the number of names on his subscription list for he cannot be certain that the names were put down by sufficient authority or should that be ascertained it still remains to be known whether they were not extorted by some overzealous friend's importunity whether the subscriber had not yielded his name merely from want of courage to answer no and with the intention of dropping the work as soon as possible one gentleman procured me nearly a hundred names for the friend and not only took frequent opportunity to remind me of his success in his canvas but laboured to impress my mind with the sense of the obligation i was under to the subscribers for as he very pertinently admonished me 
fifty-two shillings a year was a large sum to be bestowed on one individual where there were so many objects of charity with strong claims to the assistance of the benevolent of these hundred patrons ninety threw up the publication before the fourth number without any notice though it was well known to them that in consequence of the distance and the slowness and irregularity of the conveyance i was compelled to lay in a stock of stamp paper for at least eight weeks beforehand each sheet of which stood me in five pence previously to its arrival at my printer's though the subscription money was not to be received till the twenty-first week after the commencement of the work and lastly though it was in nine cases out of ten impracticable for me to receive the money for two or three numbers without paying an equal sum for the postage in confirmation of my first caveat i will select one fact among many on my list of subscribers among a considerable number of names equally flattering was that of an earl of cork with his address he might as well have been an earl of bottle for aught i knew of him who had been content to reverence the peerage in abstracto rather than in concretus of course the friend was regularly sent as far if i remember right as the eighteenth number that is till a fortnight before the subscription was to be paid and lo just at this time i received a letter from his lordship reproving me in language far more lordly than courteous for my impudence in directing my pamphlets to him who knew nothing of me or my work seventeen or eighteen numbers of which however his lordship was pleased to retain probably for the culinary or post-culinary conveniences of his servants secondly i warn all others from the attempt to deviate from the ordinary mode of publishing a work by the trade i thought indeed that to the purchaser it was indifferent whether thirty per cent of the purchase money went to the booksellers or to the government and that the convenience of receiving the work by this post at his own door would give the preference to the latter it is hard i own to have been labouring for years in collecting and arranging the materials to have spent every shilling that could be spared after the necessaries of life had been furnished in buying books or in journeys for the purpose of consulting them or of acquiring facts at the fountain-head then to buy the paper pay for the printing and the like all at least fifteen per cent beyond what the trade would have paid and then after all to give thirty per cent not of the net profits but of the gross results of the sale to a man who is merely to give the book shelf or warehouse room and permit his apprentice to hand them over the counter to those who may ask for them and this too copy by copy although if the work be on any philosophical or scientific subject it may be years before the edition is sold off all this i confess must seem a hardship and one to which the products of industry in no other mode of exertion are subject yet even this is better far better than to attempt in any way to unite the functions of author and publisher but the most prudent mode is to sell the copyright at least of one or more editions for the most that the trade will offer by few only can a large remuneration be expected but fifty pounds and ease of mind are of more real advantage to a literary man than the chance of five hundred with the certainty of insult and degrading anxieties i shall have been grievously misunderstood if this statement should be interpreted as written with the desire of detracting from the character of booksellers or publishers the individuals did not make the laws and customs of their trade but as in every other trade take them as they find them until the evil can be proved to be removable and without the substitution of an equal or greater inconvenience it were neither wise nor manly even to complain of it but to use it as a pretext for speaking or even for thinking or feeling unkindly or probably of the tradesmen as individuals would be something worse than unwise or even than unmanly it would be immoral and calumnious my motives point in a far different direction and to far other objects as will be seen in the conclusion of the chapter a learned and exemplary old clergyman who many years ago went to his reward followed by the regrets and blessings of his flock published at his own expense two volumes octavo entitled a new theory of redemption the work was most severely handled in the monthly or critical review i forget which and this unprovoked hostility became the good old man's favourite topic of conversation among his friends well he used to exclaim in the second edition i shall have an opportunity of exposing both the ignorance and the malignity of the anonymous critic two or three years however passed by without any tidings from the bookseller who had undertaken the printing and publication of the work and who was perfectly at his ease as the author was known to be a man of large property at length the accounts were written for and in the course of a few weeks they were presented by the rider for the house in person my old friend put on his spectacles and holding the scroll with no very firm hand began paper so much oh moderate enough not at all beyond my expectation printing so much well moderate enough stitching covers advertisements carriage and so forth so much still nothing amiss cellarage for orthography is no necessary part of a bookseller's literary acquirement three pounds three shillings bless me only three guineas for the what do you call it the cellarage no more sir replied the rider nay but that is too moderate rejoined my old friend only three guineas for selling a thousand copies of a work in two volumes oh sir cries the young traveller you have mistaken the word 
there have been none of them sold they have been sent back from london long ago and this three pounds three shillings is for the cellarage or warehouse room in our bookseller the work was in consequence preferred from the ominous seller of the publishers to the author's garret and on presenting a copy to an acquaintance the old gentleman used to tell the anecdote with great humour and still greater good nature with equal lack of worldly knowledge i was a far more than equal sufferer for it at the very outset of my authorship toward the close of the first year from the time that in an inauspicious hour i left the friendly cloisters and the happy grove of quiet ever honoured jesus college cambridge i was persuaded by sundry philanthropists and anti to set on foot a periodical work entitled the watchman that according to the general motto of the work all might know the truth and that the truth might make us free in order to exempt it from the stamp tax and likewise to contribute as little as possible to the supposed guilt of a war against freedom it was to be published on every eighth day thirty-two pages large octavo closely printed and price only fourpence accordingly with a flaming prospectus knowledge is power to cry the state of the political atmosphere and so forth i set off on a tour to the north from bristol to sheffield for the purpose of procuring customers preaching by the way in most of the great towns as an hireless volunteer in a blue coat and white waistcoat that not a rag of the woman of babylon might be seen on me for i was at that time and long after though a trinitarian that is ad normam platonis in philosophy yet a zealous unitarian in religion more accurately i was a silanthropist one of those who believe our lord to have been the real son of joseph and who lay the main stress on the resurrection rather than on the crucifixion oh never can i remember those days with either shame or regret for i was most sincere most disinterested my opinions were indeed in many and most important points erroneous but my heart was single wealth rank life itself then seemed cheap to me compared with the interest of what i believed to be the truth and the will of my maker i cannot even accuse myself of having been actuated by vanity for in the expansion of my enthusiasm i did not think of myself at all my campaign commenced at birmingham and my first attack was on a rigid calvinist a tallow chandler by trade he was a tall dingy man in whom length was so predominant over breadth that he might almost have been borrowed for a foundry poker oh that face a face cat and fasin i have it before me at this moment the lank black twine-like hair pinguinitescent cut in a straight line along the black stubble of his thin gunpowder eyebrows that looked like a scorched aftermath from a last week's shaving his coat-collar behind in perfect unison both of colour and lustre with the coarse yet glib cordage which i suppose he called his hair and which with a bend inward at the nape of the neck the only approach to flexure in his whole figure slunk in behind his waistcoat while the countenance lank dark very hard and with strong perpendicular furrows gave me a dim notion of some one looking at me through a used gridiron all soot grease and iron but he was one of the thoroughbred a true lover of liberty and as i was informed had proved to the satisfaction of many that mr pitt was one of the horns of the second beast in the revelations that spake as a dragon a person to whom one of my letters of recommendation had been addressed was my introducer it was a new event in my life my first stroke in the new business i had undertaken of an author yea and of an author trading on his own account my companion after some imperfect sentences and a multitude of hums and haws abandoned the cause to his client and i commenced an harangue of half an hour to philolutheros the tallow chandler varying my notes through the whole gamut of eloquence from the ratiocinative to the declamatory and in the latter from the pathetic to the indignant i argued i described i promised i prophesied and beginning with the captivity of nations i ended with the near approach of the millennium finishing the whole with some of my own verses describing that glorious state out of the religious musings such delights as float to earth permitted visitants when in some hour of solemn jubilee the massive gates of paradise are thrown wide open and forth come in fragments wild sweet echoes of unearthly melodies and odours snatched from beds of amaranth and they that from the crystal river of life spring up on freshened wing ambrosial gale my taper man of lights listened with perseverant and praiseworthy patience though as i was afterwards told on complaining of certain gales that were not altogether ambrosial it was a melting day with him and what sir he said after a short pause might the cost be only fourpence oh how i felt the anticlimax the abysmal bathos of that fourpence only fourpence sir each number to be published on every eighth day that comes to a deal of money at the end of a year and how much did you say there was to be for the money thirty-two pages sir large octavo closely printed thirty and two pages bless me why except what i does in a family way on the sabbath that's more than i ever read sir all the year round i am as great a one as any man in brummagen sir for liberty and truth and all them sort of things but as to this no offence i hope sir i must beg to be excused so ended my first canvass from causes that i shall presently mention i made but one other application in person 
This took place at Manchester, to a stately and opulent wholesale dealer in cottons. He took my letter of introduction, and having perused it, measured me from head to foot, and again from foot to head, and then asked if I had any bill or invoice of the thing. I presented my prospectus to him. He rapidly skimmed and hummed over the first side, and still more rapidly the second and concluding page, crushed it within his fingers and the palm of his hand, then most deliberately and significantly rubbed and smoothed one part against the other, and lastly, putting it into his pocket, turned his back on me with an overrun with these articles, and so without another syllable retired into his counting-house, and I can truly say, to my unspeakable amusement. This, I have said, was my second and last attempt. On returning baffled from the first, in which I had vainly essayed to repeat the miracle of Orpheus with a Brummagem patriot, I dined with the tradesman who had introduced me to him. After dinner he importuned me to smoke a pipe with him, and two or three other illuminati of the same rank. I objected both because I was engaged to spend the evening with a minister and his friends, and because I had never smoked except once or twice in my lifetime, and then it was herb tobacco mixed with Oronuku. On the assurance, however, that the tobacco was equally mild, and seeing too that it was of a yellow colour, not forgetting the lamentable difficulty I have always experienced in saying no, and in abstaining from what the people about me were doing, I took half a pipe, filling the lower half of the bowl with salt. I was soon, however, compelled to resign it, in consequence of a giddiness and distressful feeling in my eyes, which, as I had drunk but a single glass of ale, must, I knew, have been the effect of the tobacco. Soon after, deeming myself recovered, I sallied forth to my engagement, but the walk in the fresh air brought on all the symptoms again, and I had scarcely entered the minister's drawing-room and opened a small packet of letters, which he had received from Bristol for me, ere I sank back on the sofa in a sort of swoon rather than sleep. Fortunately, I had found just time enough to inform him of the confused state of my feelings, and of the occasion. For here and thus I lay, my face like a wall that is whitewashing, deathly pale, and with the cold drops of perspiration running down it from my forehead, while one after another there dropped in the different gentlemen, who had been invited to meet and spend the evening with me, to the number of from fifteen to twenty. As the poison of tobacco acts but for a short time, I at length awoke from insensibility, and looked round on the party, my eyes dazzled by the candles which had been lighted in the interim. By way of relieving my embarrassment, one of the gentlemen began the conversation with, "'Have you seen a paper to-day, Mr. Coleridge?' "'Sir,' I replied, rubbing my eyes, "'I am far from convinced that a Christian is permitted to read either newspapers or any other works of merely political and temporary interest. This remark, so ludicrously inapposite to, or rather incongruous with, the purpose, for which I was known to have visited Birmingham, and to assist me in which they were all then met, produced an involuntary and general burst of laughter.' and seldom indeed have I passed so many delightful hours, as I enjoyed in that room from the moment of that laugh till an early hour the next morning. Never, perhaps, in so mixed and numerous a party have I since heard conversation sustained with such animation, enriched with such variety of information, and enlivened with such a flow of anecdote. Both then and afterwards they all joined in dissuading me from proceeding with my scheme, assured me in the most friendly and yet most flattering expressions that neither was the employment fit for me, nor I fit for the employment. Yet, if I determined on persevering in it, they promised to exert themselves to the utmost to procure subscribers, and insisted that I should make no more applications in person, but carry on the canvas by proxy. The same hospitable reception, the same dissuasion, and, that failing, the same kind exertions in my behalf, I met with at Manchester, Derby, Nottingham, Sheffield, indeed at every place in which I took up my sojourn. I often recall with affectionate pleasure the many respectable men who interested themselves for me, a perfect stranger to them not a few of whom I can still name among my friends. They will bear witness for me how opposite even then my principles were to those of Jacobinism, or even of democracy, and can attest the strict accuracy of the statement which I have left on record in the tenth and eleventh numbers of the Friend. From this rememberable tour I returned with nearly a thousand names on the subscription list of the watchman, yet more than half convinced that prudence dictated the abandonment of the scheme. But for this very reason I persevered in it, for I was at that period of my life so completely hag-ridden by the fear of being influenced by selfish motives, that to know a mode of conduct to be the dictate of prudence was a sort of presumptive proof to my feelings that the contrary was the dictate of duty. Accordingly, I commenced the work which was announced in London by long bills in letters larger than had ever been seen before, and which, I have been informed, for I did not see them myself, eclipsed the glories even of the lottery puffs. But alas, the publication of the very first number was delayed beyond the day announced for its appearance, in the second number, an essay against fast days, with a most censurable application of a text from Isaiah for its motto, lost me near five hundred of my subscribers at one blow. In the two following numbers I made enemies of all my Jacobin and democratic patrons, for, disgusted by their infidelity and their adoption of French morals with French philosophy, and perhaps thinking that charity ought to begin nearest home, 
Instead of abusing the government and the aristocrats chiefly or entirely, as had been expected of me, I levelled my attacks at modern patriotism, and even ventured to declare my belief, that whatever the motives of ministers might have been for the sedition, or as it was then the fashion to call them the gagging bills, yet the bills themselves would produce an effect to be desired by all the true friends of freedom, as far as they should contribute to deter men from openly declaiming on subjects, the principles of which they had never bottomed, and from pleading to the poor and ignorant, instead of pleading for them. At the same time I avowed my conviction that national education and a concurring spread of the gospel were the indispensable condition of any true political amelioration. Thus, by the time the seventh number was published, I had the mortification. But why should I say this, when in truth I cared too little for anything that concerned my worldly interests to be at all mortified about it, of seeing the preceding numbers exposed in sundry old iron shops for a penny apiece? At the ninth number I dropped the work, but from the London publisher I could not obtain a shilling. He was a and set me at defiance. From other places I procured but little, and after such delays as rendered that little worth nothing, and I should have been inevitably thrown into jail by my Bristol printer, who refused to wait even for a month, for a sum between eighty and ninety pounds, if the money had not been paid for me by a man by no means affluent, a dear friend, who attached himself to me from my arrival at Bristol, who has continued my friend, with a fidelity unconquered by time, or even by my own apparent neglect, a friend from whom I never received an advice that was not wise, nor a remonstrance that was not gentle and affectionate. Conscientiously an opponent of the first revolutionary war, yet with my eyes thoroughly open to the true character and impotence of the favourers of revolutionary principles in England, principles which I held in abhorrence, for it was part of my political creed that whoever ceased to act as an individual by making himself a member of any society not sanctioned by his government, forfeited the rights of a citizen, a vehement anti-ministerialist, but after the invasion of Switzerland a more vehement anti-Gallican, and still more intensely an anti-Jacobin, I retired to a cottage at Stowey, and provided for my scanty maintenance by writing verses for a London morning paper. I saw plainly that literature was not a profession by which I could expect to live, for I could not disguise from myself that whatever my talents might or might not be in other respects, yet they were not of the sort that could enable me to become a popular writer, and that whatever my opinions might be in themselves, they were almost equidistant from all the three prominent parties, the Pittites, the Foxites, and the Democrats. Of the unsaleable nature of my writings I had an amusing memento one morning from my own servant-girl, for happening to rise at an earlier hour than usual, I observed her putting an extravagant quantity of paper into the grate in order to light the fire, and mildly checked her for her wastefulness. La, sir, replied poor Nanny, why, it is only watchman. I now devoted myself to poetry and to the study of ethics and psychology, and so profound was my admiration at this time of Hartley's essay on man, that I gave his name to my first-born. In addition to the gentleman, my neighbour, whose garden joined on to my little orchard, and the cultivation of whose friendship had been my sole motive in choosing Stowey for my residence, I was so fortunate as to acquire, shortly after my settlement there, an invaluable blessing in the society and neighbourhood of one to whom I could look up with equal reverence, whether I regarded him as a poet, a philosopher, or a man. His conversation extended to almost all subjects except physics and politics, with the latter he never troubled himself. Yet neither my retirement, nor my utter abstraction, from all the disputes of the day, could secure me, in those jealous times, from suspicion and obloquy, which did not stop at me, but extended to my excellent friend, whose perfect innocence was even adduced as a proof of his guilt, one of the many busy sycophants of that day, I here use the word sycophant in its original sense, as a wretch who flatters the prevailing party by informing against his neighbours, under pretence that they are exporters of prohibited figs or fancies, for the moral application of the term, it matters not which, one of these sycophantic law-mongrels, discoursing on the politics of the neighbourhood, uttered the following deep remark. As to Coleridge, there is not so much harm in him, for he is a whirlbrain that talks whatever comes uppermost. But that, he is the dark traitor. You never hear him say a syllable on the subject. Now that the hand of Providence has disciplined all Europe into sobriety as men tame wild elephants by alternate blows and caresses, now that Englishmen of all classes are restored to their old English notions and feelings, it will with difficulty be credited how great an influence was at that time possessed and exerted by the spirit of secret defamation, the too constant attendant on party zeal, during the restless interim from 1793 to the commencement of the Addington administration, or the year before the truce of Amiens. For by the latter period the minds of the partisans, exhausted by excess of stimulation and humbled by mutual disappointment, had become languid. The same causes that inclined the nation to peace disposed the individuals to reconciliation, both parties had found themselves in the wrong. The one had confessedly mistaken the moral character of the revolution, 
and the other had miscalculated both its moral and its physical resources. The experiment was made at the price of great, almost, we may say, of humiliating sacrifices, and wise men foresaw that it would fail, at least in its direct and ostensible object. Yet it was purchased cheaply, and realised an object of equal value, and, if possible, of still more vital importance, for it brought about a national unanimity, unexampled in our history since the reign of Elizabeth, and providence, never wanting to a good work when men have done their parts, soon provided a common focus in the cause of Spain, which made us all once more Englishmen, by at once gratifying and correcting the predilections of both parties. The sincere reverers of the throne felt the cause of loyalty ennobled by its alliance with that of freedom, while the honest zealots of the people could not but admit that freedom itself assumed a more winning form, humanised by loyalty and consecrated by religious principle. The youthful enthusiasts, who, flattered by the morning rainbow of the French Revolution, had made a boast of expatriating their hopes and fears, now, disciplined by the succeeding storms, and sobered by increase of years, had been taught to prize and honour the spirit of nationality, as the best safeguard of national independence, and this again as the absolute prerequisite and necessary basis of popular rights. If in Spain, too, disappointment has nipped our too forward expectations, yet all is not destroyed that is checked. The crop was perhaps springing up too rank in the stalk to kern well, and there were doubtless symptoms of the Gallican blight on it. If superstition and despotism have been suffered to let in their wolvish sheep to trample and eat it down even to the surface, yet the roots remain alive, and the second growth may prove the stronger and healthier for the temporary interruption. At all events, to us heaven has been just and gracious. The people of England did their best, and have received their rewards. Long may we continue to deserve it. Causes which it had been too generally the habit of former statesmen to regard as belonging to another world, are now admitted by all ranks to have been the main agents of our success. We fought from heaven, the stars in their courses fought against Cicero. If then unanimity grounded on moral feelings has been among the least equivocal sources of our national glory, that man deserves the esteem of his countrymen, even as patriots, who devotes his life and the utmost efforts of his intellect to the preservation and continuance of that unanimity by the disclosure and establishment of principles. For by these all opinions must be ultimately tried, and, as the feelings of men are worthy of regard only as far as they are the representatives of their fixed opinions, on the knowledge of these all unanimity, not accidental and fleeting, must be grounded. Let the scholar who doubts this assertion refer only to the speeches and writings of Edmund Burke at the commencement of the American War, and compare them with his speeches and writings at the commencement of the French Revolution. He will find the principles exactly the same, and the deductions the same, but the practical inferences almost opposite in the one case from those drawn in the other yet in both equally legitimate, and in both equally confirmed by the results. Whence gained he the superiority of foresight? Whence arose the striking difference, and in most instances even, the discrepancy between the grounds assigned by him, and by those who voted with him, on the same questions? How are we to explain the notorious fact that the speeches and writings of Edmund Burke are more interesting at the present day than they were found at the time of their first publication, while those of his illustrious confederates are either forgotten, or exist only to furnish proofs that the same conclusion, which one man had deduced scientifically, may be brought out by another in consequence of errors, that luckily chance to neutralise each other. It would be unhandsome as a conjecture, even were it not, as it actually is, false in point of fact, to attribute this difference to the deficiency of talent on the part of Burke's friends, or of experience, or of historical knowledge. The satisfactory solution is that Edmund Burke possessed and had sedulously sharpened that eye which sees all things, actions, and events in relation to the laws that determine their existence and circumscribe their possibility. He referred habitually to principles. He was a scientific statesman, and therefore a seer. For every principle contains in itself the germs of a prophecy, and, as the prophetic power is the essential privilege of science, so the fulfilment of its oracle supplies the outward and, to men in general, the only test of its claim to the title. Wearisome as Burke's refinements appear to his parliamentary auditors, yet the cultivated classes throughout Europe have reason to be thankful that he went on refining, and thought of convincing, while they thought of dining. Our very signboard, said an illustrious friend to me, give evidence, that there has been a Titian in the world. In like manner, not only the debates in Parliament, not only our proclamations and state papers, but the essays and leading paragraphs of our journals, are so many remembrances of Edmund Burke. Of this the reader may easily convince himself, if either by recollection or reference he will compare the opposition newspapers at the commencement and during the five or six following years of the french revolution with the sentiments and grounds of argument assumed in the same class of journals at present and for some years past 
whether the spirit of jacobinism which the writings of burke exercised from the higher and from the literary classes may not like the ghost in hamlet be heard moving and mining in the underground chambers with an activity the more dangerous because less noisy may admit of a question i have given my opinions on this point and the grounds of them in my letters to judge fletcher occasioned by his charge to the wexford grand jury and published in the courier be this as it may the evil spirit of jealousy and with it the cerberian whelps of feud and slander no longer walk their rounds in cultivated society far different were the days to which these anecdotes have carried me back the dark guesses of some zealous quidnunc met with so congenial a soil in the grave alarm of a titled dogbury of our neighbourhood that a spy was actually sent down from the government for a surveillance of myself and friend there must have been not only abundance but variety of these honourable men at the disposal of ministers for this proved a very honest fellow after three weeks truly indian perseverance in tracking us for we were commonly together during all which time seldom were we out of doors but he contrived to be within hearing and all the while utterly unsuspected how indeed could such a suspicion enter our fancies he not only rejected sir dogbury's request that he would try yet a little longer but declared to him his belief that both my friend and myself were as good subjects for what he could discover to the contrary as any in his majesty's dominions he had repeatedly hid himself he said for hours together behind a bank at the seaside our favourite seat and overheard our conversation at first he fancied that we were aware of our danger for he often heard me talk of one spy nosy which he was inclined to interpret of himself and of a remarkable feature belonging to him but he was speedily convinced that it was the name of a man who had made a book and lived long ago our talk ran most upon books and we were perpetually desiring each other to look at this and to listen to that but he could not catch a word about politics once he had joined me on the road this occurred as i was returning home alone from my friend's house which was about three miles from my own cottage and passing himself off as a traveller he had entered into conversation with me and talked of purpose in a democrat way in order to draw me out the result it appears not only convinced him that i was no friend of jacobinism but he added i had plainly made it out to be such a silly as well as wicked thing that he felt ashamed though he had only put it on i distinctly remembered the occurrence and had mentioned it immediately on my return repeating what the traveller with his bardolf nose had said with my own answer and so little did i suspect the true object of my tempter er accuser that i expressed with no small pleasure my hope and belief that the conversation had been of some service to the poor misled malcontent this incident therefore prevented all doubt as to the truth of the report which through a friendly medium came to me from the master of the village inn who had been ordered to entertain the government gentleman in his best manner but above all to be silent concerning such a person being in his house at length he received sir dogbury's commands to accompany his guest at the final interview and after the absolving suffrage of the gentleman honoured with the confidence of ministers answered as follows to the following queries d well landlord and what do you know of the person in question l i see him often pass by with maister my landlord that is the owner of the house and sometimes with the newcomers at holford but i never said a word to him or he to me d but do you not know that he has distributed papers and handbills of a seditious nature among the common people l no your honour i never heard of such a thing d have you not seen this mr coleridge or heard of his haranguing and talking to knots and clusters of the inhabitants what are you grinning at sir l beg your honour's pardon but i was only thinking how they'd have stared at him if what i have heard be true your honour they would not have understood a word he said when our vicar was here dr l the master of the great school and canon of windsor there was a great dinner-party at maister's and one of the farmers that was there told us that he and the doctor talked real hebrew greek at each other for an hour together after dinner d answer the question sir does he ever harangue the people l i hope your honour ain't angry with me i can say no more than i know i never saw him talking with any one but my landlord and our curate and the strange gentleman d has he not been seen wandering on the hills towards the channel and along the shore with books and papers in his hand taking charts and maps of the country l why as to that your honour i own i have heard i am sure i would not wish to say ill of anybody but it is certain that i have heard d speak out man don't be afraid you are doing your duty to your king and government what have you heard l why folks do say your honour as how that he is a poet and that he is going to put quantock and all about here in print and as they be so much together i suppose that the strange gentleman has some concern in the business so ended this formidable inquisition the latter part of which alone requires explanation and at the same time entitles the anecdote to a place in my literary life i had considered it as a defect in the admirable poem of the task that the subject which gives the title to the work was not 
and indeed could not be carried on beyond the three or four first pages and that throughout the poem the connections are frequently awkward and the transitions abrupt and arbitrary i sought for a subject that should give equal room and freedom for description incident and impassioned reflections on men nature and society yet supply in itself a natural connection to the parts and unity to the whole such a subject i conceive myself to have found in a stream traced from its source in the hills among the yellow-red moss and conical glass-shaped tufts of bent to the first break or fall where its drops become audible and it begins to form a channel thence to the peat and turf barn itself built of the same dark squares as it sheltered to the sheepfold to the first cultivated plot of ground to the lonely cottage and its bleak garden won from the heath to the hamlet the villages the market town the manufactories and the seaport my walks therefore were almost daily on the top of quantock and among its sloping combes with my pencil and memorandum book in my hand i was making studies as the artists call them and often moulding my thoughts into verse with the objects and imagery immediately before my senses many circumstances evil and good intervened to prevent the completion of the poem which was to have been entitled the brook had i finished the work it was my purpose in the heat of the moment to have dedicated it to our then committee of public safety as containing the charts and maps with which i was to have supplied the french government in aid of their plans of invasion and these too for a tract of coast that from clevedon to minehead scarcely permits the approach of a fishing-boat all my experience from my first entrance into life to the present hour is in favour of the warning maxim that the man who opposes in toto the political or religious zealots of his age is safer from their obloquy than he who differs from them but in one or two points or perhaps only in degree by that transfer of the feelings of private life into the discussion of public questions which is the queen bee in the hive of party fanaticism the partisan has more sympathy with an intemperate opposite than with a moderate friend we now enjoy an intermission and long may it continue in addition to far higher and more important merits our present bible societies and other numerous associations for national or charitable objects may serve perhaps to carry off the superfluous activity and fervour of stirring minds in innocent hyperboles and the bustle of management but the poison tree is not dead though the sap may for a season have subsided to its roots at least let us not be lulled into such a notion of our entire security as not to keep watch and ward even on our best feelings i have seen gross intolerance shown in support of toleration sectarian antipathy most obtrusively displayed in the promotion of an undistinguishing comprehension of sex an act of cruelty i had almost said of treachery committed in furtherance of an object vitally important to the cause of humanity and all this by men too of naturally kind dispositions and exemplary conduct the magic rod of fanaticism is preserved in the very adita of human nature and needs only the re-exciting warmth of a master hand to bud forth afresh and produce the old fruits the horror of the peasants war in germany and the direful effects of the anabaptist tenets which differed only from those of jacobinism by the substitution of theological for philosophical jargon struck all europe for a time with affright yet little more than a century was sufficient to obliterate all effective memory of these events the same principles with similar though less dreadful consequences were again at work from the imprisonment of the first charles to the restoration of his son the fanatic maxim of extirpating fanaticism by persecution produced a civil war the war ended in the victory of the insurgents but the temper survived and milton had abundant grounds for asserting that presbyter was but old priest writ large one good result thank heaven of this zealotry was the re-establishment of the church and now it might have been hoped that the mischievous spirit would have been bound for a season and a seal set upon him that he should deceive the nation no more but no the ball of persecution was taken up with undiminished vigour by the persecuted the same fanatic principle that under the solemn oath and covenant had turned cathedrals into stables destroyed the rarest trophies of art and ancestral piety and hunted the brightest ornaments of learning and religion into holes and corners now marched under episcopal banners and having first crowded the prisons of england emptied its whole vial of wrath on the miserable covenanters of scotland a merciful providence at length constrained both parties to join against a common enemy a wise government followed and the established church became and now is not only the brightest example but our best and only sure bulwark of toleration the true and indispensable bank against a new inundation of persecuting zeal esto perpetua a long interval of quiet succeeded or rather the exhaustion had produced a cold fit of the ache which was symptomatized by indifference among the many and a tendency to infidelity or scepticism in the educated classes at length those feelings of disgust and hatred which for a brief while the multitude had attached to the crimes and absurdities of sectarian and democratic fanaticism were transferred to the oppressive privileges of the noblesse and the luxury intrigues and favouritism of the continental courts 
the same principles dressed in the ostentatious garb of a fashionable philosophy once more rose triumphant and effected the french revolution and have we not within the last three or four years had reason to apprehend that the detestable maxims and correspondent measures of the late french despotism had already bedimmed the public recollections of democratic frenzy had drawn off to other objects the electric force of the feelings which had massed and upheld those recollections and that a favourable occurrence of occasions was alone wanting to awaken the thunder and precipitate the lightning from the opposite quarter of the political heaven in part from constitutional indolence which in the very heyday of hope had kept my enthusiasm in check but still more from the habits and influences of a classical education and academic pursuits scarcely had a year elapsed from the commencement of my literary and political adventures before my mind sank into a state of thorough disgust and despondency both with regard to the disputes and the parties disputant with more than poetic feeling i exclaimed the sensual and the dark rebel in vain slaves by their own compulsion in mad game they break their manacles to wear the name of freedom graven on a heavier chain o liberty with profitless endeavour have i pursued thee many a weary hour but thou nor swell'st the victor's pomp nor ever didst breathe thy soul in forms of human power alike from all higher they praise thee nor prayer nor boastful name delays thee from superstition's harpy minions and factious blasphemies obscener slaves thou speedest on thy cherub pinions the guide of homeless winds and playmate of the waves End of chapter ten part one chapter ten part two of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee biographia literaria by samuel taylor coleridge chapter ten part two i retired to a cottage in somersetshire at the foot of quantock and devoted my thoughts and studies to the foundations of religion and morals here i found myself all afloat doubts rushed in broke upon me from the fountains of the great deep and fell from the windows of heaven the fontal truths of natural religion and the books of revelation alike contributed to the flood and it was long ere my ark touched on an ararat and rested the idea of the supreme being appeared to me to be as necessarily implied in all particular modes of being as the idea of infinite space in all the geometrical figures by which space is limited i was pleased with the cartesian opinion that the idea of god is distinguished from all other ideas by involving its reality but i was not wholly satisfied i began then to ask myself what proof i had of the outward existence of anything of this sheet of paper for instance as a thing in itself separate from the phenomenon or image in my perception i saw that in the nature of things such proof is impossible and that of all modes of being that are not objects of the senses the existence is assumed by a logical necessity arising from the constitution of the mind itself by the absence of all motive to doubt it not from any absolute contradiction in the supposition of the contrary still the existence of a being the ground of all existence was not yet the existence of a moral creator and governor in the position that all reality is either contained in the necessary being as an attribute or exists through him as its ground it remains undecided whether the properties of intelligence and will are to be referred to the supreme being in the former or only in the latter sense as inherent attributes or only as consequences that have existence in other things through him were the latter the truth then notwithstanding all the pre-eminence which must be assigned to the eternal first from the sufficiency unity and independence of his being as the dread ground of the universe his nature would yet fall far short of that which we are bound to comprehend in the idea of god for without any knowledge or determining resolve of its own it would only be a blind necessary ground of other things and other spirits and thus would be distinguished from the fate of certain ancient philosophers in no respect but that of being more definitely and intelligibly described for a very long time indeed i could not reconcile personality with infinity and my head was with spinoza though my whole heart remained with paul and john yet there had dawned upon me even before i had met with the critique of the pure reason a certain guiding light if the mere intellect could make no certain discovery of a holy and intelligent first cause it might yet supply a demonstration that no legitimate argument could be drawn from the intellect against its truth and what is this more than st paul's assertion that by wisdom more properly translated by the powers of reasoning no man ever arrived at the knowledge of god what more than the sublimest and probably the oldest book on earth has taught us silver and gold man searcheth out bringeth the ore out of the earth and darkness into light but where findeth he wisdom where is the place of understanding the abyss crieth 
it is not in me. Ocean echoeth back, not in me. Whence then cometh wisdom? Where dwelleth understanding? Hidden from the eyes of the living, kept secret from the fowls of heaven. Hell and death answer, we have heard the rumour thereof from afar. God marketh out the road to it, God knoweth its abiding place. He beholdeth the ends of the earth, he surveyeth what is beneath the heavens. And as he weighed out the winds, and measured the sea, and appointed laws to the rain, and a path to the thunder, a path to the flashes of the lightning, then did he see it, and he counted it. He searched into the depth thereof, and with a line did he compass it round. But to man he said, The fear of the Lord is wisdom for thee, and to avoid evil, that is thy understanding. I became convinced that religion, as both the cornerstone and the keystone of morality, must have a moral origin so far at least that the evidence of its doctrines could not like the truths of abstract science be wholly independent of the will it were therefore to be expected that its fundamental truth would be such as might be denied though only by the fool and even by the fool from the madness of the heart alone the question then concerning our faith in the existence of a god not only as the ground of the universe by his essence but as its maker and judge by his wisdom and holy will appeared to stand thus the sciential reason, the objects of which are purely theoretical, remains neutral, as long as its name and semblance are not usurped by the opponents of the doctrine. But it then becomes an effective ally by exposing the false show of demonstration, or by evincing the equal demonstrability of the contrary from premises equally logical. The understanding meantime suggests, the analogy of experience facilitates, the belief. Nature excites and recalls it, as by a perpetual revelation. Our feelings almost necessitate it, and the law of conscience peremptorily commands it. The arguments that at all apply to it are in its favour, and there is nothing against it but its own sublimity. It could not be intellectually more evident without becoming morally less effective, without counteracting its own end by sacrificing the life of faith to the cold mechanism of a worth less, because compulsory, assent. The belief of a god in a future state, if a passive acquiescence may be flattered with the name of belief, does not indeed always beget a good heart but a good heart so naturally begets the belief that the very few exceptions must be regarded as strange anomalies from strange and unfortunate circumstances. From these premises I proceeded to draw the following conclusions. First, that having once fully admitted the existence of an infinite yet self-conscious creator, we are not allowed to ground the irrationality of any other article of faith on arguments which would equally prove that to be irrational, which we had allowed to be real. Secondly, that whatever is deducible from the admission of a self-comprehending and creative spirit may be legitimately used in proof of the possibility of any further mystery concerning the divine nature. Possibilitatem mysteriorum, trinitatis, etc. Contra insultus infidelium, et hereticorum, a contradictionibus vindico. Haud quidem veritatem, quae revelatione sola stabiliri posit, says Leibniz in a letter to his duke. He then adds the following just and important remark. In vain will tradition or text of scripture be adduced in support of a doctrine. Donne clava impossibilitatis et contradictionis e manibus horum herculum extorta fueret. For the heretic will still reply that text, the literal sense of which is not so much above as directly against all reason, must be understood figuratively, as Herod is a fox, and so forth. These principles are held philosophically, while, in respect of revealed religion, I remained a zealous Unitarian. I consider the idea of the Trinity a fair scholastic inference from the being of God as a creative intelligence, and that it was therefore entitled to the rank of an esoteric doctrine of natural religion. But seeing in the same no practical or moral bearing, I confined it to the schools of philosophy. The admission of the Logos as hypostasized, that is, neither a mere attribute nor personification, in no respect removed my doubts concerning the Incarnation and the Redemption by the Cross which I could neither reconcile in reason with the impassiveness of the divine being, nor in my moral feelings with the sacred distinction between things and persons, the vicarious payment of a debt and the vicarious expiation of guilt. A more thorough revolution in my philosophic principles, and a deeper insight into my own heart, were yet wanting. Nevertheless, I cannot doubt that the difference of my metaphysical notions from those of Unitarians in general contributed to my final reconversion to the whole truth in Christ, even as, according to his own confession, the books of certain Platonic philosophers, Libri Quorundam Platonicorum, commenced the rescue of St. Augustine's faith, from the same error aggravated by the far darker accompaniment of the Manichaean heresy. 
while my mind was thus perplexed by a gracious providence for which i can never be sufficiently grateful the generous and munificent patronage of mr josiah and mr thomas wedgwood enabled me to finish my education in germany instead of troubling others with my own crude notions and juvenile compositions i was thenceforward better employed in attempting to store my own head with the wisdom of others i made the best use of my time and means and there is therefore no period of my life on which i can look back with such unmingled satisfaction after acquiring a tolerable sufficiency in the german language at ratzeburg which with my voyage and journey thither i have described in the friend i proceeded through hanover to Göttingen. here i regularly attended the lectures on physiology in the morning and on natural history in the evening under blumenbach a name as dear to every englishman who has studied at that university as it is venerable to men of science throughout europe eichhorn's lectures on the new testament were repeated to me from notes by a student from ratzeburg a young man of sound learning and indefatigable industry who is now i believe a professor of the oriental languages at heidelberg but my chief efforts were directed towards a grounded knowledge of the german language and literature from professor tixon i received as many lessons in the gothic of ulfilas as sufficed to make me acquainted with its grammar and the radical words of most frequent occurrence and with the occasional assistance of the same philosophical linguist i read through otfried's metrical paraphrase of the gospel and the most important remains of the theotiscan or the transitional state of the teutonic language from the gothic to the old german of the swabian period of this period the polished dialect of which is analogous to that of our chaucer and which leaves the philosophic student in doubt whether the language has not since then lost more in sweetness and flexibility than it has gained in condensation and copiousness i read with sedulous accuracy the minnesinger or singers of love the provencal poets of the swabian court and the metrical romances and then laboured through sufficient specimens of the master singers their degenerate successors not however without occasional pleasure from the rude yet interesting strains of hans sachs the cobble of nuremberg of this man's genius five folio volumes with double columns are extant in print and nearly an equal number in manuscript yet the indefatigable bard takes care to inform his readers that he never made a shoe the less but had virtuously reared a large family by the labour of his hands in pindar chaucer dante milton and many more we have instances of the close connection of poetic genius with the love of liberty and of genuine reformation the moral sense at least will not be outraged if i add to the list the name of this honest shoemaker a trade by the by remarkable for the production of philosophers and poets his poem entitled the morning star was the very first publication that appeared in praise and support of luther and an excellent hymn of hans sachs which has been deservedly translated into almost all the european languages was commonly sung in the protestant churches whenever the heroic reformer visited them in luther's own german writings and eminently in his translation of the bible the german language commenced i mean the language as it is at present written that which is called the high german as contradistinguished from the platt teusch the dialect on the flat or northern countries and from the obertoisch the language of the middle and southern germany the high german is indeed a lingua communis not actually the native language of any province but the choice and fragrancy of all the dialects from this cause it is at once the most copious and the most grammatical of all the european tongues within less than a century after luther's death the german was inundated with pedantic barbarisms a few volumes of this period i read through from motives of curiosity for it is not easy to imagine anything more fantastic than the very appearance of their pages almost every third word is a latin word with a germanized ending the latin portion being always printed in roman letters while in the last syllable the german character is retained at length about the year sixteen twenty hopitz arose whose genius more nearly resembled that of dryden than any other poet who at present occurs to my recollection in the opinion of lessing the most acute of critics and of adelung the first of lexicographers opitz and the silesian poets his followers not only restored the language but still remain the models of pure diction a stranger has no vote on such a question but after a repeated perusal of the works of opitz my feelings justified the verdict and i seem to have acquired from them a sort of tact for what is genuine in the style of later writers of the splendid era which commenced with gellert klopstock ramler lessing and their compeers i need not speak with the opportunities which i enjoyed it would have been disgraceful not to have been familiar with their writings and i have already said as much as the present biographical sketch requires concerning the german philosophers whose works for the greater part i became acquainted with at a far later period soon after my return from germany i was solicited to undertake the literary and political department in the morning post and i acceded to the proposal on the condition that the paper should thenceforwards be conducted on certain fixed and announced principles and that i should neither be obliged nor requested to deviate from them in favour of any party or any event 
in consequence that journal became and for many years continued anti-ministerial indeed yet with a very qualified approbation of the opposition and with far greater earnestness and zeal both anti-jacobin and anti-gallican to this hour i cannot find reason to approve of the first war either in its commencement or its conduct nor can i understand with what reason either mr percival whom i am singular enough to regard as the best and wisest minister of this reign nor the present administration can be said to have pursued the plans of mr pitt the love of their country and perseverant hostility to french principles and french ambition are indeed honourable qualities common to them and to their predecessor but it appears to me as clear as the evidence of the facts can render any question of history that the successors of the percival and of the existing ministry have been owing to their having pursued measures the direct contrary to mr pitt's such for instance are the concentration of the national force to one object the abandonment of the subsidizing policy so far at least as neither to goad nor bribe the continental courts into war till the convictions of their subjects had rendered it a war of their own seeking and above all in their manly and generous reliance on the good sense of the english people and on that loyalty which is linked to the very heart of the nation by the system of credit and the interdependence of property be this as it may i am persuaded that the morning post proved a far more useful ally to the government in its most important objects in consequence of its being generally considered as moderately anti-ministerial than if it had been the avowed eulogist of mr pitt the few whose curiosity or fancy should lead them to turn over the journals of that date may find a small proof of this in the frequent charges made by the morning chronicle that such and such essays or leading paragraphs had been sent from the treasury the rapid and unusual increase in the sale of the morning post is a sufficient pledge that genuine impartiality with a respectable portion of literary talent will secure the success of a newspaper without the aid of party or ministerial patronage but by impartiality i mean an honest and enlightened adherence to a code of intelligible principles previously announced and faithfully referred to in support of every judgment on men and events not indiscriminate abuse not the indulgence of an editor's own malignant passions and still less if that be possible a determination to make money by flattering the envy and cupidity the vindictive restlessness and self-conceit of the half-witted vulgar a determination almost fiendish but which i have been informed has been boastfully avowed by one man the most notorious of these mob sycophants from the commencement of the addington administration to the present day whatever i have written in the morning post or after that paper was transferred to other proprietors in the courier has been in defence or furtherance of the measures of government things of this nature scarce survive that night that gives them birth they perish in the sight cast by so far from after-life that there can scarcely aught be said but that they were yet in these labours i employed and in the belief of partial friends wasted the prime and manhood of my intellect most assuredly they added nothing to my fortune or my reputation the industry of the weak supplied the necessities of the weak from government or the friends of government i not only never received remuneration nor ever expected it but i was never honoured with a single acknowledgment or expression of satisfaction yet the retrospect is far from painful or matter of regret i am not indeed silly enough to take as anything more than a violent hyperbole of party debate mr fox's assertion that the late war i trust that the epithet is not prematurely applied was a war produced by the morning post or i should be proud to have the words inscribed on my tomb as little do i regard the circumstance that i was a specified object of bonaparte's resentment during my residence in italy in consequence of those essays in the morning post during the peace of amiens of this i was warned directly by baron von humboldt the prussian plenipotentiary who at that time was the minister of the prussian court at rome and indirectly through his secretary by cardinal fesch himself nor do i lay any greater weight on the confirming fact that an order for my arrest was sent from paris from which danger i was rescued by the kindness of a noble benedictine and the gracious connivance of that good old man the present pope for the late tyrant's vindictive appetite was omnivorous and preyed equally on a duc d'enghien and the writer of a newspaper paragraph like a true vulture napoleon with an eye not less telescopic and with a taste equally coarse in his ravin could descend from the most dazzling heights to pounce on the leveret in the brake or even on the field mouse amid the grass but i do derive a gratification from the knowledge that my essays contributed to introduce the practice of placing the questions and events of the day in a moral point of view in giving a dignity to particular measures by tracing their policy or impolicy to permanent principles and an interest to principles by the application of them to individual measures in mr burke's writings indeed the germs of almost all political truths may be found but i dare assume to myself the merit of having first explicitly defined and analysed the nature of jacobinism and that in distinguishing the jacobin from the republican the democrat and the mere demagogue i both rescued the word from remaining a mere term of abuse and put on their guard many honest minds who even in their heat of zeal against jacobinism 
admitted or supported principles from which the worst parts of that system may be legitimately deduced that these are not necessary practical results of such principles we owe to that fortunate inconsequence of our nature which permits the heart to rectify the errors of the understanding the detailed examination of the consular government and its pretended constitution and the proof given by me that it was a consummate despotism in masquerade extorted a recantation even from the morning chronicle which had previously extolled this constitution as the perfection of a wise and regulated liberty on every great occurrence i endeavoured to discover in past history the event that most nearly resembled it i procured wherever it was possible the contemporary historians memorialists and pamphleteers then fairly subtracting the points of difference from those of likeness as the balance favoured the former or the latter i conjectured that the result would be the same or different in the series of essays entitled a comparison of france under napoleon with rome under the first caesars and in those which followed on the probable final restoration of the bourbons i feel myself authorised to affirm by the effect produced on many intelligent men that were the dates wanting it might have been suspected that the essays had been written within the last twelve months the same plan i pursued at the commencement of the spanish revolution and with the same success taking the war of the united provinces with philip the second as the groundwork of the comparison i have mentioned this from no motives of vanity nor even from motives of self-defence which would justify a certain degree of egotism especially if it be considered how often and grossly i have been attacked for sentiments which i have exerted my best powers to confute and expose and how grievously these charges acted to my disadvantage while i was in malta or rather they would have done so if my own feelings had not precluded the wish of a settled establishment in that island but i have mentioned it from the full persuasion that armed with the twofold knowledge of history and the human mind a man will scarcely earn his judgment concerning the sum total of any future national event if he have been able to procure the original documents of the past together with authentic accounts of the present and if he have a philosophic tact for what is truly important in facts and in most instances therefore for such facts as the dignity of history has excluded from the volumes of our modern compilers by the courtesy of the age entitled historians to have lived in vain must be a painful thought to any man and especially so to him who has made literature his profession i should therefore rather condole than be angry with the mind which could attribute to no worthier feelings than those of vanity or self-love the satisfaction which i acknowledge myself to have enjoyed from the republication of my political essays either whole or as extracts not only in many of our own provincial papers but in the federal journals throughout america i regarded it as some proof of my not having laboured altogether in vain that from the articles written by me shortly before and at the commencement of the late unhappy war with america not only the sentiments were adopted but in some instances the very language in several of the massachusetts state papers but no one of these motives nor all conjointly would have impelled me to a statement so uncomfortable to my own feelings had not my character been repeatedly attacked by an unjustifiable intrusion on private life as of a man incorrigibly idle and who entrusted not only with ample talents but favoured with unusual opportunities of improving them had nevertheless suffered them to rust away without any efficient exertion either for his own good or that of his fellow-creatures even if the compositions which i have made public and that too in a form the most certain of an extensive circulation though the least flattering to an author's self-love had been published in books they would have filled a respectable number of volumes though every passage of merely temporary interest were omitted my prose writings have been charged with a disproportionate demand on the attention with an excess of refinement in the mode of arriving at truths with beating the ground for that which might have been run down by the eye with the length and laborious construction of my periods in short with obscurity and the love of paradox but my severest critics have not pretended to have found in my compositions triviality or traces of a mind that shrunk from the toil of thinking no one has charged me with tricking out in other words the thoughts of others or with hashing up anew the cramben yam decies coctam of english literature or philosophy seldom have i written that in a day the acquisition or investigation of which had not cost me the previous labour of a month but are books the only channel through which the stream of intellectual usefulness can flow is the diffusion of truth to be estimated by publications or publications by the truth which they diffuse or at least contain i speak it in the excusable warmth of a mind stung by an accusation which has not only been advanced in reviews of the widest circulation not only registered in the bulkiest works of periodical literature but by frequency of repetition has become an admitted fact in private literary circles and thoughtlessly repeated by too many who call themselves my friends and whose own recollections ought to have suggested a contrary testimony would that the criterion of a scholar's utility were the number and moral value of the truths which he has been the means of throwing into the general circulation 
or the number and value of the minds whom by his conversation or letters he has excited into activity and supplied with the germs of their aftergrowth a distinguished rank might not indeed even then be awarded to my exertions but i should dare look forward with confidence to an honourable acquittal i should dare appeal to the numerous and respectable audiences which at different times and in different places honoured my lecture-rooms with their attendance whether the points of view from which the subjects treated of were surveyed whether the grounds of my reasoning were such as they had heard or read elsewhere or have since found in previous publications i can conscientiously declare that the complete success of the remorse on the first night of its representation did not give me as great or as heartfelt a pleasure as the observation that the pit and boxes were crowded with faces familiar to me though of individuals whose names i did not know and of whom i knew nothing but that they had attended one or other of my courses of lectures it is an excellent though perhaps somewhat vulgar proverb that there are cases where a man may be as well in for a pound as for a penny to those who from ignorance of the serious injury i have received from this rumour of having dreamed away my life to no purpose injuries which i unwillingly remember at all much less am disposed to record in a sketch of my literary life or to those who from their own feelings or the gratification they derive from thinking contemptuously of others would like job's comforters attribute these complaints extorted from me by the sense of wrong to self-conceit or presumptuous vanity i have already furnished such ample materials that i shall gain nothing by withholding the remainder i will not therefore hesitate to ask the consciences of those who from their long acquaintance with me and with the circumstances are best qualified to decide or be my judges whether the restitution of the sum quique would increase or detract from my literary reputation in this exculpation i hope to be understood as speaking of myself comparatively and in proportion to the claims which others are entitled to make on my time or my talents by what i have effected am i to be judged by my fellow-men what i could have done is a question for my own conscience on my own account i may perhaps have had sufficient reason to lament my deficiency in self-control and the neglect of concentring my powers to the realization of some permanent work but to verse rather than to prose if to either belongs the voice of mourning for keen pangs of love awakening as a babe turbulent with an outcry in the heart and fear self-willed that shun the eye of hope and hope that scarce would know itself from fear sense of past youth and manhood come in vain and genius given and knowledge won in vain and all which i had culled in wood-walks wild and all which patient toil had reared and all commune with thee had opened out but flowers strewed on my corpse and borne upon my bier in the same coffin for the self-same grave these will exist for the future i trust only in the poetic strains which the feelings at the time called forth in those only gentle reader affectus animi varios bellumque sequesis pelagis invidiae curasque revolvis inanes quas humilis teneris stilus olim effudit in evo pelagis et lacrimas a quod firetratus acuta ille puer puera facit mihi cuspide vulnus omnia paulatim consumit longio etas vivendo que simu morimo rapimo que manendo ipse mihi colatis enim non ille videbo frons alia es morisque ali nova mentis imago vox aliud que sonat jamque observatio vitae multa dedit lugue nihil feri omnia jamque Paulatim lacrimas rerum experientia tersit. End of chapter 10, part 2.